Welcome to Essex, Britain's gangland frontier. Two of the county's more infamous villains are Brothers Eddie and Billy Blundell. Deemed to be more dangerous than the Cray Brothers, the Blundells are the most powerful figures in the region. When a leading member of a notorious gang assaulted their cousin Pepe, there was only ever going to be one response, extreme violence. We had cousin Pepe, he used to run with us, he used to work with us full time. He got involved with a, with a woman who was related by marriage to somebody else. He'd already cleared it with him because they weren't together, but of course this other guy was one of the end of a lot, which I'll call them. Um, and he was as nice as pie, but of course then one day when he's pissed, he decided to spank um, Pepe. So I decided to spank him. And then that kicked off a little bit. And uh, anyway, they, they went after Pepe one night, fired a shot, uh, hand pistol through the front door of our headquarters at uh, 7th Avenue. They fired through, they didn't get him. He'd run straight upstairs and it was dark in there. They didn't go in, they just fired through the door. Um, and that, and then there was a bit of an argument between me and them across the road a few days later, but again, when they come back from the pub drunk, trying about, because Pepe apparently is supposed to have made a statement, which I knew he hadn't. But I said, yeah, he'd made a statement. Oh, it's like, fuck off, piss off out of it. Anyway, one night we're out. Was it the volunteer, that pub? Yeah. The volunteer, so we're there, what, five, six-handed? Uh-huh. Top whack. Their little firm come in, again, four or five-handed. Um, and we weren't worried about them, just fucking drunkards, you know? Um, that was it, so we're talking, we're having a laugh, this, that and the other, one of them come over, Wiltshire. Hey, all right, early boy, what's, what's happening about this statement that Pepe's made? I said, listen, all right, Pepe's made no fucking statement, all right? No fucking statement, at all. Yeah, well, we were, uh, I said, oh, fuck off. Anyway, started getting into one. Billy reacted before I did and smashed a glass in his face all his neck and that there. Um, and that was it, he just bounced him all round the floor. I didn't have to interfere, none of my lads had to interfere. But, well, we didn't have a chance to react because he took over straight away. He just went in with crash, bang, wallop, knocked him all over the floor. And when he got up, he didn't know who'd hit him. He said to me, who done that? He said, you do that, Eddie boy. He said, no, mate, the little one done that. And then that kicked off again about a month later. Mm, yeah. Something like that, Ilford. Yeah. Again, we and him are doing the books for the end of the season in our office, 41 7th Avenue. Knock at the door, drunk arsehole from across the road. Oh, back in fight, you take his coat off, throw it on the floor. So I kicked him up the bollocks. Um, I gave him a swift kick, and uh, that was that. Then as I went out of the door, then Wiltshire was there with the knife, and there was about three others. And with that, Billy started putting some bits and pieces about, smashed that window, should have gone out and smashed their window over the road. But um, he tried to do one of them in the doorway and done the window instead. <coughs> anyway, they, they decided then they couldn't handle it, so they backed off. Bare knuckle boxer Donny the Bull Adams was known as the King of the Gypsies. However, he lost his crown when he fought Cray associate Roy Pretty Boy Shaw in a bout that lasted less than 20 seconds. Adams was to lose a lot more than his crown when he took on the Blundells. We were based at the room at the top, and uh, we also had a spy in air camp who was telling us what was going on, marking our cards, and uh, we knew that they were getting a team up. Donny Adams was one of them. We got cab office in Ilford, and so Billy went and told up himself. We sent a couple of our soldiers, and they went and told up. So we're waiting in there. Um, Billy come back. Our blokes turned up with the guns. As they pulled up outside, the other firm pulled up at the same time. There's Billy was talking to him. Yeah. Billy was talking to him, uh, our driver, and he saw him get out of the motor. So, of course, he comes straight back into the office for me, uh, marked my card that they're here. The other two got out of the car to fight them, but, of course, they didn't have the guns with them when they got out of the car. They didn't realise the other team was, was already talked. Yeah, and so shots off, went yeah. off in the street. Yeah. One of them, one of our guys took off with, uh, I think it's a big Humber he had, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, he took off yeah. up the long, wide pavement along the road with the other one, Kenny, laying across the bonnet, holding on. Just got away from the shooting and that. But of course, we're in the minicab office. They're outside. They're tooled. Our tools have just drove off. Billy's OK, he's got a shotgun, but it's in his car and it's around the side street. So when we've gone when we've gone back in the office, 
We can't go out the front because they're armed. So we go out the back. I'm too fat to get over the fence, so was Johnny Ferry. We lifted Billy over the fence. Billy went and got his shotgun. He came in, then he came in through the back. Johnny Ferry went at him with a big ashtray. And I think the only reason he shot us, really, I think he panicked. Yeah, you know, he just went, bum, bum. I caught one in the leg. Johnny Ferry got a ricochet in the arm. Then I could hear shooting outside. Me and uh, Donny Adams had a confrontation. Because that boy, I didn't even know my brother had been shot then. Anyway, I cracked Donny Adams with the butt of the rifle, but I held the, the, the rifle like a club by the, the end of the barrel, and I clubbed him right on the head with it. And uh, he just shook his head. So I turned it round and went to shoot him, and he took off, dived into the cab, so I shot him in the back as he went through. In the end, they've used ammonia to blind him and, and get near him, and uh, obviously you can see the scars on the face. We arrive at the hospital, I go in on the trolley, they hand me over to a matron who looks after me while they get the operating theatre ready. I'd lost eight pints, um, and that was it. Billy Blundell was charged with attempted murder. During his old Bailey trial, he told the jury that he had acted in self-defence and was found not guilty. Having gun battles in a public street inevitably led to the police wanting to curtail the Blundell's activities. Whilst incarcerated in Maidstone Prison, Billy fell out with a fellow inmate. The inmate was a close friend of one of the UK's most feared families, and so Billy was warned to back down. You had this guy there, Dougie Weaver, his name was. And um, supposed to be the right pal of uh, Patsy Adams. You know, so everybody had to keep clear of him, supposedly. Weaver he starts mouthing off to me, so I just give it to him. I just crack. And his eye come up like a like an egg. No, I just basically got I got arrested and uh, I got um, put in the the block, what they called the block at the time. And uh, then uh, Patsy Adams made himself busy, and he's supposed to be the big shot and all that, f so full of himself you wouldn't believe his brothers were supposed to be doing this and doing that, so, which they probably were, and they were wealthy people. I don't know nothing about them, so I can't say nothing about them. But him, I know because I've lived with it for four years, and I, you know, you get to know someone, you get to know whether they're an arsehole or not. And I, as far as I'm concerned, he's an arsehole. He's running around with someone who'd grasp me up, arm in arm, like talking this, calling this one a grass and that, and he's walking around with one on the exercise, you know? And uh, anyway, I hear that he's busy himself. So some said to me, Bill, don't go up the gym because he's gonna be down the gym waiting for you. I said, I'm not. Gonna hide from that arsehole. He's come in with a load of others and he went to me, uh, yeah, Blundell, he said, uh, he said, do, do you want a row? And then went and threw a punch like my sister could have done better. So I slipped under it, I, I give it to him, held his head down and just kept punching him. And everybody else was trying to jump on me back and all that. And then I let go, I punched more people than, than, I, than I had time, everyone around me. But then well, some of the black boys then got involved and they'd run like greyhounds. Anyway, so with that Patsy Adams, the next day, I sent Ricky, Ricky Curley up to go and see him to tell him that if he really fancies having a row, we'll have it there, put bag gloves on to make out we're sparring. They can get up on the wall bars, we can have it there. So he sent a message back, no, 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 it's all over now. I knew it would be all over, because he's frightened of his own shadow by the look of him, you know? And um, he's like a bean pole, you know? So uh, anyway, that's, that's my running with the so-called Patsy Adams, the A team, I keep calling them the asshole team. I don't know them, but to him, I do know because then because he's a complete liar because he gets out of prison and he goes, I'll give it a blunder in Mason and half hour later he was shipped out. I was still there two years after he'd left. So, you know, just, just lies. Next time I saw him was at um, Mason. Um, Chelmsford. Chelmsford Prison, I was on remand and he was in there. There is a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Patsy Adams, I said, I'm Billy Blunt. I said, I'd I had problems with you at Mason, didn't I? I said, have I got a problem with you here? He said, yeah, if you want it, so I'll give it to him. I mean, bang, 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 and uh, done the same thing, held his end down, because he couldn't fight, just put, puts his hands out, clawing me. So I do, they ain't got no spirits, they go like that. So I was just, just giving it to him. Anyway, I got arrested again. I'm an old man now, but I can shoot and stab as well as anybody else. Lou Yates had arrived in London during the 70s 
to fight bare-knuckle legend Roy Shaw. But delays surrounding the bout resulted in him trying to maintain order in the jungle that was the Essex nightclub scene. Uh, I was living in Lancashire and I heard on the radio that Roy Shaw wanted to fight anybody in the country. So uh, I fancied that. And so I rung my mate up in London, in Essex, for his gate, and can you get it sorted out? I'll come down tomorrow and fight him tomorrow. So I was really fit and everything, so... Anyway, he said, uh, yeah, come down, but we won't be able to sort out that quick. So I come down to London in about 76, I think it was. And, uh, but I couldn't, when I got down there, I realised I had to have 10 grand back in and all this, that, the other, which I didn't have. And I started working on the doors. I started with a room at the top in Ilford, uh, working on the Peter Costa and that. Um, I worked there for about four and a half years. Uh, one night there was, uh, a bit of a do at the end of the night. And then it all started with Billy's lot, because there was a lot in there of Billy's. All Billy's blokes who worked on the ice cream vans and all that type of crap. Anyway, ended up, I was doing, I was doing Billy, he put his head down, bump, and then I got a double mug on my head, split my head down to the skull, and I went loopy then. I said, I feel the blood, sorry. And I ended up doing Billy and, and uh, about seven of them all together. And even in the lift, I was after the big fellas with a knife. They were all pulling back, you just see their eyes, and the lads were saying, oh, who pulling me, holding me back? These cratty lads who I used to work with, work out with and that. Another club Lou Yates worked at was Latrex in Dagenham, where he gave the notorious West Ham United football hooligan, Carlton Leach, his first job working the doors. So I was on the door at Latrex, and then uh, this young guy come up to the door, asked about any work and all that. And I said, well, I'll try you out, which I always did. I'll give you a couple of weeks, see how you go. Um, and then somebody said that he was Andy and all this, that and the other. Uh, so I put him on the door and he worked on the door for a while for me. Uh, but I, want, I remember one instance, and he remember this. There was a big crowd on the pavement was rowing with. And the bouncy one come towards Carlton. Carlton had a duster on, done him, split him like he had two mouths. And uh, Carlton, uh, he, he was, the bloke carried on walking towards him. So I went in between them. So I said to him, now fuck off. I said, because I hate you, you go to sleep. And he, I said, you're spitting blood on me now. You're spitting blood on me. Stop, bang, he's gone. And I turned to Carlton and said, that's how you do it, Carlton. In the 1980s, an underground youth movement grew into a cultural phenomenon that would change Britain's underworld forever. Acid House Music was founded by DJs in Chicago and soon spread to the UK. The new music scene was fueled by the equally new love drug ecstasy. A pioneer of the rave generation was a man named Andy Swallow. He had been one of the leading members of West Ham United's football hooligans, who became known as the Intercity Firm. My, my journey into house music probably came around about 87, 88, when I come out of the football, uh, out of one of the biggest gangs, the Intercity Firm. Uh, we moved over from sort of football into parties. Um, one of our first biggest parties was uh, in Stratford. Uh, we found a big warehouse, tidied it up. Uh, it, it was a proper mess, big cages in there. And uh, I remember putting on a party, done a little flyer, did a little flyer, and it had a, a car, drawn car going over a bridge, flew all the clubs. Um, that night I had one doorman who took the money, and my friend's mum lived around the corner, and we had over 5,000 people there. So, and every half an hour we used to go to her house, and sh she told us the next day all she could hear all through the night was <laughs> FUD. And that was the money hitting the floor. And in the morning she woke up and she found these stacks of envelopes with all this money in. Over the period, we sort of moved out the Blundells, had some land. Uh, I remember doing a big, big party on one of their fields somewhere. I moved into South End. We did parties in South End. We did them in Rayleigh, the pink toothbrush. Uh, I did them all over Essex, really. We formed a radio station, Centre Force Radio 88.3, which was the biggest independent private pirate radio station. Pretty much the police become hot on us because we was the ones telling everybody where to go. And I don't mean it telling them where to go, we was the information. 
if you had a big party and you wanted people around the M25, you come to Centreforth Radio. And we was the biggest sort of party people, putting people into, into raves. How did that work? If, you know, you're on the radio, what... Yeah, basically what would happen is, uh, if we did our own, or, or you would do maybe, uh, you know, a Woodstock. We did a Woodstock three days in a field. Basically what would happen is, round about nine, we would promote through the day, be at such and such service stations around the, the M25. They all knew where to be. South Mims was a prime example. Everybody would be there. A number would be given out for them to ring. They would either ring that number, or we would get told round about 10 o'clock, go to this, thing, uh, this venue or this area and bang, everybody would converge at the same time in the same place, which would be very hard for anybody to... It's like a military operation. Uh, approximately how many people? Uh, when we did Woods, Woodstock, we had up to 20,000. You know, I know of people that did from 5,000 to people that did 30,000. You know, I know uh, Tony did their sunrises. Um, they did uh, the big airfield and they had something like 30,000. So it, it would be military operation in trying to get 5, 10,000, 20,000 people into an area in an hour. That takes some doing, and, and we had the capability of doing it. The success of the raves, but more so the fact that they were drug fueled, led to the government of the day ordering the police to disrupt or preferably close down Swallow's operation. I think as momentum grown, and then the, the, the sort of like the drug side of it, and I think that side, they knew they had to get a grip. And it, it became political. It became a, a political as, as far as Thatcher bringing a legislation to stop it. So from one, you know, you used to have one copper turn up in a panda car to riot squads turning up. But what we noticed for about six, seven months, we was on constantly, day and night. We was the only 24-hour radio station. And we thought, this is brilliant, you know, we're, we're, we're the kings, you know, we, we was getting all the advertising, we were doing all the parties. What we didn't know was the police were doing a seven month surveillance operation on us. So they wanted us there, they wanted to see us in action, and, and they watched us for, for seven months, which became into a big court case. What, what was that conspiracy to...? Um, it was... It was it was for the partying, which was a new legislation, but they'd done us for uh, racketeering, uh, supplying drugs, which was uh, to all the clubs. We, we was in court for a night and a couple of months, two months. Trial was going really well. And one of our, one of our people came in and said, uh, that one of the jury keeps winking at me on the train, I think we've got this. And I said, listen, whatever you do, don't go near the jury. We're winning this trial. Next day we comes in, someone had tampered with a jury. So while I'm saying to the fellow, you must have spoke to him, you must have spoke to him. They said, can everybody leave the courtroom and sit with Mr Swallow? So I sat there, done, done me for jury nobbling, said that I'd tampered with a jury. But what happened was, there was a fellow on another jury, he was a jury member, had gone up to our jury and said, oh, are you on the Swallows trial? They said, yeah. He said, do you know if you get them off, you'll get a nice few quid. That jury member ran off, put me away for three days, while they was trying to find the jury member who'd said it. Um, we got let out, they, they disbanded the jury, and a new retrial, but they put half a million pounds worth of drugs on us. It wasn't on the first trial. Um, our barristers set up, stood up and said, we can't take this any further. Uh, it came to light there was a police informer amongst us. Um, they wasn't prepared to name the police informer. The trial collapsed. So from there, um, we came out and went and put another party on. The vast amount of money being made prompted other young entrepreneurs to try and set up similar radio stations and events. Allegations of former ICF members confiscating transmitters and beating up DJs were made on an almost weekly basis, but few, if any, agreed to assist the police. With the emergence of mainstream radio stations like KISS FM, the lucrative underground rave movement was slowly turning mainstream simply because of its own success. The then Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, recognised this and saw it was a way of seizing control from the gangs. Thatcher introduced a bill. Um, basically, she'd she done a bit of a smart move. Well, we was becoming uncontrollable, you know, I'm not just saying us, I'm talking about the, the, the whole movement. And w when we talk about it, you know, it was a massive movement right across the country. London was massive and, and, and you know, Manchester had their own thing. But she did this, uh, you know, the, 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 to stop us, to put us into clubs. So basically what they done, they, 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 they legislated that if you was found, you'd be arrested, the, the equipment would be seized, and that's where they done. They got into, like, 
Cole Cox was our light and sound man. Cole Cox was my light, sound and DJ for 300 quid. You know, you couldn't get Cole Cox for 300 quid. But at that time, he came through with us. But what happened with Cole and all the others, they was confiscating their equipment. So they was hitting them. You, so you couldn't put parties on because they take all the equipment away. They take all the DJs away. They take all your records away. So people didn't want to be doing it. And what they'd done, they pushed us into nightclubs. And really, we thought we'd had a result because we could go to Legends, we could go to Future, we could go to Heaven, even though Heaven was already running. We thought we was being smart, but basically we lost our identity. We lost the right to party. But we broke down the doors that people of today can dance till six o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning. Once raves moved from open fields and warehouses into nightclubs, they became subject to licensing laws. However, regardless of location, villains would always control the sale of drugs. No drugs, there'd be no clubs. There'd be no clubs, there'd have been no, definitely would have been no rave scene. But I even think it, it looks to today of the best clubs, I don't say it's the best drugs, I don't know, but, but, but are drug related clubs. Anywhere there could be black market money, you're going to get criminal elements moving, and, and, and then you get your gang, my territory, your territory. And I think that's, what, as I say, with no drugs, there's no clubs. The underground rave scene exploded onto the mainstream stage and for a short period excluded the criminal elements. In 1987, I had started work as a doorman at Raquel's nightclub in Basildon. Within a year or two, I had taken over security at the club and Raquel's began to put on raves. In 1993, I formed a partnership with a man named Tony Tucker. With the rave music came drugs and with Tony Tucker came Pat Tate. He was well known in the Essex underworld after making a dramatic escape from Billericay Magistrates Court. He had assaulted the police that were guarding him, vaulted the dock and ran outside into the street where a waiting motorbike whisked him away. He had later surfaced in Spain where he met up with Eddie Blundell. Pat Tate, I spent a bit of time with in Spain when he was on the run. Puerto Belus was the place. Everybody was there, the gold bullion mob was there, the security express mob was there, the Cougaran mob was there, and I found him a very nice guy. I really got on well with him. I liked him a lot. Um, but obviously, he wasn't on drugs at the time, you know, and, and the stuff that happened consequently, obviously, you know, once they start putting drugs up their nose and, and mistreating other people, then obviously people are gonna get to dislike them. Shortly after I had met Tucker, he, Tate and their sidekick Craig Rolfe began to binge on drugs. This led to them believing that they were all powerful. Countless families were terrorised. Three young people died after taking drugs they had supplied. Women were forced into prostitution and at least one man, Kevin Whittaker, was murdered. The door firm I had founded had turned into a psychotic group of bullies. The loyalty of everyone who worked with or for us was questioned. Every favour offered was exploited and every friendship form was destroyed. It was only a matter of time before one of the trio, or indeed all three, would die. One fateful day, me and my friend, uh, in a garage in Leon C, bashed into Steve Ellis, who was telling us about a friend of his, Pat Tate, who'd not been long out of prison, and was starting on a new venture that was gonna make anyone involved a lot of money. Um, gave us the number, my friend was not interested at all, but I kept the number and uh, rang it one day. Got a lady, very nice, sweet little lady on the end of the phone that then turns out to be Pat Tate's mum, Marie. Pat came round the next day to interview me. I had a flat in Westcliff at the time. And it was like a whirlwind arriving in my flat. Pat stands, I think, about 6'2", 6'3". And at the time when I knew him, was training and was fairly fit and he's got to weigh probably 18, 19 stone. He was probably the biggest bloke at that time I've ever met. Um, and he's very, very bouncy, very bouncy man. And he just came in my flat like a whirlwind. Hello, I'm Pat, and just thought um, I was actually there for a job as one of the girls, um, as in to be working for him, where we didn't set off on good footing because uh, I told Pat that's not what I was there for. I was more looking for a managerial or administrative position, which at first he started laughing, um, was trying to convince me to have my hair in pigtails and that I'd earn a lot more money doing other things. Um, we sort of not fell out, but I just said, no, that's not for me. Um, 
after quite a quite a long chat and a laugh with him because he was a nice a nice man and I could see what he wanted to do and he wanted to make a lot of money um, in the ideas he had he just didn't quite know how to put them into practice um, he then asked me if I would work with his mum um, and help run things uh, to start with he was saying oh you should have your hair in pigtails you could go out as an 18 year old and basically it was um, a parlour Pat was running he wanted to get quite a lot of uh, girls together and he wanted to be one of the biggest agencies in Essex. That was Pat's plan. Um, he had a friend that worked for the papers where all the advertising went and he'd already lined up a lot of advertising. He already lined up a, a place where people would visit and he had, I think at the time, five or six girls and he was recruiting daily as he knew quite a lot of girls in that area. And basically, I was going to help run it with his mum. In the massage bar? Then. Yeah, take the calls, um, people can go to the property, or if the girls go out and visit, um, he had a lot of men that were more than helpful and more than happy to drive the girls round um, to help him make a big business. Um, I think within about a week, Pat had a parlour in, opened up in South End, and the phones were pretty much ringing off the hook 24-7. Pat had a couple of friends. One friend I met, Tony Tucker. They were crazy people to go out with. They took a lot of drugs. To start with, it was just pills, which back 94, 95 seemed to be very socially acceptable. Um, then it sort of progressed onto cocaine, but not, not too bad. They, they were just really party animals. Um, they would go out clubbing and they would just keep going and going and going. All of Tucker and Tate's friendships followed the same pattern. First embrace, use and then lose. If you had no use, then no friendship was offered. The drugs made Tucker and Tate think that everyone and everything was on this planet for their benefit. A young man working in a pizza shop was beaten up because he didn't sell the type of pizza that Tate demanded. Tucker beat up a family man who had fitted his kitchen and kept him in a dog's kennel for days, simply because the work wasn't satisfactory. Even Tate being asked to adhere to a dress code in a pub resulted in mindless violence. I think he was with Steve Ellis, Nipper. Um, they wouldn't let him in because he had jeans on. And a couple of the doormen that normally would let him in, I think one was on holiday, and these particular guys, I think they were out to prove a point a bit because Pat was becoming quite well known, even though he'd only been out of prison a couple of months. They wouldn't let him in. Well, from what I'd gathered, Pat got in. Um, I think part of the door came off, not quite sure. There was quite a scuffle. I think they literally stayed for one drink just to prove a point, but I think all hell set loose um, in Churchill's. I know Nipper's car number plate, because he had a little private number plate then, was taken by the manager of uh, Churchill's back then. But what they didn't know was obviously there was a lot of stuff in the boot of that car that Pat turned up with at the Canvey house in an absolute frenzy. Nipper by then had gone off somewhere, he'd gone to ground. I remember Pat turning up with a friend in another car, basically with two great big holdalls saying, can you just stick them in the other room, don't touch them, leave them there until I ring you and bring them with you. It must have been about two hours I had to wait him to ring me and it was it was a real long two hours and then I had to get a cab and he was really insistent don't let the cab driver hold these bags you hold them don't let them touch them and they were heavy and obviously I didn't let the cabbie get near them which I think he thought was a bit weird and I had to go over to Rayleigh in Essex and meet them at a party and there was guns in there I don't know what sort of guns but they were big guns and that's just the world they were they were living in and after a while when you'd been around them long enough it came acceptable it's just pat would keep a gun in a parlor um, a lot of the girls were unaware of it but i knew he had one there there was always drugs in the parlor um yeah we could have got raided at any point but you just became aware of it being there and after a while like i say it just become very acceptable of, of how his life was in november 1995 18-year-old Leah Betts collapsed and died after taking an ecstasy pill that had been supplied by Tucker and Tate. 
they began threatening and blaming other people, one of which was an associate of the Blundell family. Billy Blundell arrived at Raquel's one evening, looking for Tucker and Tate, and he appeared to be far from happy. Well, I went to the club there where you was to look for him. That's right. Because, uh, you know, there was a bit of a conflict and I needed to, to uh, talk to him, you know? And uh, for some reason, uh, Tucker, was it Tucker? Tucker wouldn't, wouldn't come and meet me. Tate, Tate's the big guy, ain't he? Yeah. Right. So he sorted out with, with, with uh, Pat and Tate to come see me. And he come down the farm and, and I told him what the score was and what was going down and now, you know, they're upsetting wrong people and uh, they're not prepared to come and talk about it. And I said, you do realise you're, you're with him all the time, aren't you? So and if anything goes down, you're going to get it as well as him. If someone creeps up behind you and goes bang in the back of the head, don't be surprised because, you know, he said, well, he looked me in the eye and he said, well, if it happens, it happens. So then I knew it was no, it was no good trying to talk to them or the other one. People were tired of Tucker and Tate's egotistical bullying. Myself and many others knew that it was only a matter of time before they would be dealt with. It was the drug taking that just spiralled so quick from a pill or a couple of pills or quite several in, in their cases to the cocaine and, and then progressed onto the crack. Him and Tony would sit there for hours, hours and hours just doing crack. And I didn't, I, until they told me how much one day they'd got for and how much money they'd spent, I was horrified. Pat went from being quite happy-go-lucky and everything was fun to then very paranoid, very sad sometimes. I think everyone could see it coming and I think when that actual announcement that they'd been shot, I don't think there was that many people that were shocked because they hit Essex in such a big way and in such a short space of time. I don't think anyone, probably in my lifetime, will ever do it again and be as talked about as what they were. Following the murders of Tucker, Tate and Rolf, a man named Damon Alvin formed a gang in the hope that he could fill and profit from the void that they had left in the drugs world. Alvin's mentor was a man named Malcolm Walsh. He was stabbed and died following a trivial dispute. Uh, Malcolm went to collect a debt off one of the Trettons and um, it, it just didn't happen for whatever, and there was an argument. Uh, that night, or the next night, uh, one of the Trettons put a lump of concrete through Malcolm's BMW window boasting about it, Malcolm got to hear about it, so he went round, found, I can't remember which trend it was, he found out which trend it was and he literally tried to put the concrete through his teeth. He was pulled off, there was arguments, the family was there. Um, Malcolm gave him a good bit of a kick in and it all got separated. Um, and then, obviously the old man, old man Trent, the one who eventually killed Malcolm, he, uh, he was pretty pissed off about it. The old man leant out the window arguing with Malcolm and said, I'm, I'm gonna fucking stab you. So, Malcolm's gonna come then. The rest is history, isn't it? Come down, stab Malcolm. Malcolm, when you need a sharp knife, that you prick. Fell down and died. Alvin, who was inconsolable with grief, armed himself with a shotgun, burst into the family home of Malcolm's killer, and opened fire on men, women, and children. Some lost body parts, others never recovered. Trettons were having a drinking and puffing session at about midnight, one o'clock. Doors been kicked in. Two two gunmen there, and uh, Balaclava up. They had shotguns, started shooting. Three of the Trettons, well, I know, they, they ran into the Trettons' place, run through the hall, found the Trettons, and they started shooting. Three of them got shot. Um, I don't know how many was in there that night, but I think one of them ran into the garden. And after that, obviously, the gunmen buggered off. One of Alvin's gang was a man named Dean Beauchel. He idolised Alvin and told people that they were, in fact, brothers. Unfortunately for Beauchel, Alvin had no intention of being his friend, let alone his brother. All he wanted to do was use Beauchel to store and distribute his drugs. Dean was uh, Damon's little gopher, always doing bits and pieces, looking after his drugs, dropping them off. And there was a time when, well, Dean used to look up after parcels, parcels of drugs for Damon. And there was a time when he was looking after a parcel and, um, well, basically went missing. Damon knew as far as he was concerned, that Dean had stolen it, so he gave him a good hiding. Um, and basically scared Dean. Dean, Dean went on the missing. And uh, Damon basically, when he caught up with him, he, uh, as far as he was concerned, Dean owed him, a, owed him big time. So he wanted to get him involved, getting a couple of shooters. At this time, a man named Mark Bradford was on police bail for the alleged murder of a heroin addict. 
Bradford had to sign on at the police station every day, and on one occasion he had seen Beauchel leaving after talking to a detective. So he told Damon that he'd seen Dean walking out the police station, and um, Damon's pulled Dean, wanting to know what he was doing down there, and Dean's then turned around and said to Damon, the old Bill pulled me in regarding the shooting of the Trettons. They know that I was driving the car, and they said basically, turn around and tell us what you know about Damon and Ricky, and we give immunity, 10 grand. There was a couple of offers that they put on the table for him, and each time he turned around and told Damon, obviously a big mistake, because Damon was getting more nervous as he was getting on, because he was sure that Dean was going to grass him. The night before Dean was killed, Damon had phoned Dean up, arranged to meet Dean, or Dean had phoned Damon, I can't remember, but I know it was something to do with, like, Dean had said, oh, I'm going to meet my brother, and he always referred to Damon as his, like, his brother. So he told a couple of people he was going to meet Damon, uh, Damon went to South End, picked him up, took him back to Westcliff, I think. Um, but then the next morning, no one see him alive again. That was it. Uh, next morning, Dean was found in the allotment. He'd been shot three times. From what I know, is he got squirted. They'd done him with like ammonia or something. Uh, he got shot. As he went down, he got another two in the head. It didn't take the police long to arrest Alvin. He denied picking Beauchel up in South End and claimed instead that he'd been in a flat with his friends Kevin Walsh and Ricky Percival. All those present made statements supporting Alvin's alibi. However, three years later, the police, using mobile phone evidence, were able to prove Damon Alvin had lied. He was charged with murder, and his friends were all charged with conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. When it all went to trial, when it went to Chelmsford, um, Damon was charged, like I say, with the murder. Ricky was charged with the alibi. Give him giving him a false alibi. Um, and they wanted to introduce proof that Dean was a grass. Dean Bushel was a grass, which would have incriminated Damon. So Damon started panicking, knowing that basically if that was introduced, he was going to get done for the murder. So um, he told his uh, barrister, I've got, I've got to talk to you, I've got to talk to you, stop the trial. Um, stop the trial, told his barrister, basically, he wanted to um, turn around and change his story which he then grasped up Ricky, saying Ricky, create, uh, Ricky committed the murder while Damon was with him. Is there any evidence whatsoever against Ricky Percival? Not as far as I know. Damon's word. Damon, Damon lived in a friggin' dream world, trying to be the big I am. He thought Pat, Tony and Craig were the big gangsters, he worshipped them, he thought they were something special, but in a way he also sort of thought I was something special, which I'm not, because I apparently shot or killed or whatever I did to... Pat, Tony and Craig, and he wanted to be like that. He wanted to always kill someone. Like I say, he was always going about his double tap, so maybe that was his chance to be, I don't know, like what he thought. Because Pat, Tony and Craig were known to have killed a couple of people. I think Damon wanted to be like that. He wanted to sort of, like, put a few notches on his gun. In regards to Rick, poor sod's been well and truly stitched up. Rick is paying the price, and his mum, mum and dad and Danny are paying the price. The Percival family are indeed paying the price. Damon Alvin was given a new identity and walked away with his wife free to start a new life. At the age of 26, Ricky was sentenced to serve a minimum of 28 years behind bars. This nightmare last started in 2003. The early hours of the morning, we had police banging at the door, woke us up, didn't know what was happening. I got up and went to the door and, I, and they're shouting, there's police, we want... Ricky Percival said, he's not here. They said, you open the door, we'll, we'll bang it down. So I opened the door and all these armed police come into my house. Um, it, was a, it was horrendous, just didn't know what was happening. They went upstairs and Danny, which is Ricky's brother, was asleep. And they got him out of bed, naked, arms behind the back and guns and everything. Then realised he wasn't Ricky let him get dressed and Danny come down, Danny was comforting me. The, they stayed all day and we couldn't go out, do anything. It was just, I can't explain it, it was just something that was a nightmare. Was, you don't think, you see it on films, you don't think it's happening. And um, I just don't know why they stayed here, with guns all along the front, all my neighbours and everybody, just all these armed police, um, when Ricky wasn't even here. Ricky had spoken to, word got to Ricky, and he'd spoken to his solicitor, and uh, she 
he went with her to the police station and um, he was let out. And uh, they come home, I just thought this is all gonna go away. I didn't think anything of it. But then she had to, he had to go with his solicitor to Harlow and she said, oh, he'll be back. He'll be back this afternoon, he'll be home. But that was 11 years ago and he's still not home. And then the nightmare carried on and went from worse. We had a 12-week trial, which was, everybody said, all our solicitors, our legal teams all said, there's no case. There's not one bit of evidence, there's no case. So they really didn't push things. As I've been told, they should have not took it for granted, but it wasn't pushed. And he was convicted after 12 weeks for 28 years he got. No, no evidence or anything, it's just one man who wanted to save himself. And he said Ricky done it because the police didn't like Ricky. He was, I think he was a little criminal. He obviously was a little criminal, he was. But he wasn't the big criminal that they tried to make him out to be. You know, like one of the Essex boys that is the big drugs baron, come murderer, come beat people. He wasn't one of them. But they always said they wanted him for something big. And they got him for something big that he never done. I still can't believe that he's away. Uh, now I'm going to crack up. I really feel sad because my mum's funeral, he couldn't even come. So he's with my dad's. We weren't at my mum's, we weren't at my sister's. So, and I suppose he'll be at mine. They more likely let him come to mine, but I won't be with him. So, I don't know, I just think, I'm praying that he gets out. I used to think, oh, maybe he will be out this year, maybe he'll be out next year. But you just, now I just pray that it will happen while I'm alive and, and I can enjoy it and hopefully we'll have a family and I'll have grandchildren. I still want somebody to show me evidence that he's done it. He might be not perfect, but he's not a killer. I know that he's not a killer. Justice comes in many forms. The law of the land dictates how we should live our lives. Natural justice is determined by circumstance. Injustice is indiscriminate and can destroy us all.